so we had a bit of a break. But it's good to be back together. Um, and I pray that as we go through the word today, uh, that you'll be encouraged in our time. Um, so the last time that we met, um, Bruce preached on Acts 11, um, verses 18 to 30. And then he skipped into chapter 12, and he read from verse 25 into chapter 13. And then we finally ended at verse 3. And in that passage, we saw how the church in Antioch grew because of the faithfulness of ordinary disciples um, and God's commitment to his promises. And like every other passage we studied, we saw how the gospel continued to spread toward the ends of the earth. And so this week, we're going to go back into chapter 12 and look at the section that um, Bruce hopped over in Acts 12, verses 1 through 24. Um, what we'll see is that Luke basically takes a page or so and gives an update on the church in Jerusalem. So this is kind of an aside. Um, and if you remember from Acts 1 and 2, Jerusalem is ground zero for the church's mission. This is where everything started. As the story develops, Luke shows us how from Jerusalem, the gospel has been spreading into Judea, into Samaria, and beyond. And we've seen the church, by the work of, by the power of the Spirit, perform miracles, endure persecution, and in our text today, Luke is going to tell us a story that reminds us that God is still working in the church in Jerusalem. He's still taking care of them. He's still providing for them. And as the gospel is going out towards the end of the earth, God is still where it started. You know? And this is good because it reminds us that God is omnipresent. You know, as the gospel continues to go out, he is still with his, with his people. He's still with his church wherever it is found. And so what Luke is going to do is bring... The Jerusalem narrative to a close and this section of the book to a close and in chapters 13 and beyond Luke will continue to focus on the spread of the gospel into the Gentile world and so if you have your Bible you can turn with me to Acts 12 and I read as I read the passage and it'll also be on the screen behind me so here's what it says about that time King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church and he executed James John's brother with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too, during the festival of unleavened bread. After the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out for the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. When Herod was about to bring him out for trial, that very night, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quick, get up, and the chains fell off his wrists. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals, and he did. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know what the angel did was really happening, but he thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and suddenly the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door of the outer gate, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. You're out of your mind, they told her, but she kept insisting that it was true, and they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. Motioning to them with his hands to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell these things to James and the brothers, he said. And he left and went to another place. At daylight, there was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had searched and did not find him, he interrogated the guards and ordered their execution. Then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, 
together they presented themselves before him. After winning over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. On an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. The assembled people began to shout, It's the voice of God and not a man. At once the angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God spread and multiplied. So, as I mentioned before, reading the passage, Luke in this text is giving us an update on the church in Jerusalem. He's reminding us that God is still working among his people for his glory and their good. And just as it's a reminder for us as readers, it's also a reminder for the church. We know from previous passages that the church has been facing great persecution. We saw the apostles face persecution in Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5. We also saw the death of Stephen in Acts 7. And so their persecution for the church continued into Acts 8. And so now, from our perspective, we can look back in time and see how God was working through that persecution to spread the good news of Jesus further and further. However, we can imagine the temptation to be discouraged that would have risen up amongst the church, knowing that all of this persecution was piling onto them time and time, after, time, and time again. And what I believe we see in our passage today is God stepping into the church's persecution to once again show himself as the one true king and giving his people memories of his goodness. God reminds his church that he remains in control of all things, and with the church pressed by persecution, God miraculously frees Peter from prison and judges King Herod. In doing so, there is no doubt that God is powerful and that his plans are not going to be stopped. Despite what earthly kings and rulers and authorities may try, they can only do ultimately what God allows them to do. So at the beginning of this passage, we again see that the church is facing more persecution. We're told that Herod violently attacked the church. And for us, I think it'll be helpful to talk a little bit about who Herod is so that we understand a little about his motivations. So the Herod in this passage is Herod Agrippa, who is actually the grandson of Herod the Great. Um, that was the king who tried to kill baby Jesus. In Acts 12, Herod Agrippa is king over Jerusalem, as well as a lot of the surrounding area. But from history, we know that even though he ruled over such a large, er large area, he didn't have an easygoing relationship with the Roman emperor. So he especially needed to do whatever he could to maintain control of the people. So to, to do so, Herod would often show faces Jewish to win the loyalty of the Jewish leaders. This explains what we see from Herod in verses 1 through 5. He is persecuting the church and opposing the people of God because it pleased the Jews and serves their selfish interests. So in this passage, the church is being persecuted by a king whose primary goal is self-preservation or job security, if you will. He doesn't have regard for the things of God and just wants to appease the religious authorities so that he can maintain control of the people under his rule. And to move this recklessly against God and his people is a clear indication that Herod is deeply prideful and arrogant. And this is the backdrop of our text today. As we turn back toward the passage, the question that we're going to be thinking about and the main question that we're going to answer today is, how does the church continue to live out Acts 1-8? In the face of intense persecution, with their backs against the wall, so to speak, how do they press forward? And here's our first point. We're going to have two points that answer this question. The first one is that the church is still committed to prayer. As we've been going through Acts and seeing how the church lives out the gospel, we can notice that prayer is central to the life of the church. And we see this evident in the number of times throughout the book that we see believers praying. And I have a few examples here for us. Acts 1.14, it says, they were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts 3.1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer 
at three in the afternoon. Acts 4, 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. Acts 8.15, after, after they went down there, they prayed for them so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit. And so what we see throughout the narrative is that the church is giving everything to God in prayer. When they're making decisions, they pray. For their safety, they pray. They pray for the sick among them. They pray for missions. They pray for repentance. And when they face persecution and crisis, they pray. So what we see in our passage today is just the normal, uh, the normal daily life of the church. They pray often and they pray together. When Herod attacks the church, killing James and arresting Peter, here's what we read in verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was praying fervently to God for him. So the church's immediate response to what was happening around them was to pray and to pray fervently. I think the ultimate reason for this is because the church understands that they don't have power in and of themselves to affect change in the world. And wrapped up in that or tied to that is the idea that the church knows that their work is an extension of God's work. So ultimately, God is the one who is responsible for making sure his work is carried on to completion. See, a part of the church's work is their commitment to prayer. This past weekend on our trip to Miami, we got to hear Pastor Gus Hernandez from Reality Church talk about the importance of missions and how we can take steps in our own lives to form strategies for reaching our community. One of the things that he drove home at the very beginning of his talk was that before we can even begin to do strategic planning as it relates to missions, we have to start with theological reflection. And what this means is that we have to study the Bible and understand what it is our mission is to do in the first place. And if we do that well, what we'll see is that our strategies and our work all come alongside the work of God. See, God is the one who initiates and orchestrates the spread of the gospel. So when the church is faced with persecution, uh, when they lose James and when Peter is arrested, in order to continue to live out the plan for their lives, they have to turn to God. When it looked like they might lose a pillar of the community of faith, they had to turn to God. And so how should we think about this in our context? We're grateful here in the West to not experience persecution like we read in our passage today, or even like we see some of our brothers and sisters around the world experience. But as we saw, the church is not just committed to prayer when they face persecution. The church is committed to prayer in all aspects of their lives, both individually and together. So this means that as believers and as members of the church body, we should be praying in all aspects of our own lives. It means that we should be praying for each other. It means that we should be praying for ourselves because prayer is essential. This is why the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing and to pray in every situation. And so what is prayer and how do we do it? Well, first, prayer is just is talking to God. It's when we set aside time, either quietly or out loud, to tell God something, to communicate to Him. It could be asking for things or confessing our sins to God or giving praise and adoration to God because He is worthy of it. Um, for the believer, our prayer should be fueled by our relationship with God. We talk to him because we love him. Prayer connects us to our source. And here's what C.S. Lewis says about the purpose of prayer. He says that prayer in the sense of petition, asking for things, is a small part of it. Confession and penitence are its threshold, adoration its sanctuary, the presence and vision and enjoyment of God its bread and wine. Lewis puts forth that the enjoyment of God his presence and his vision is the ultimate end of prayer. The reason why we pray is because we love God and we want to know him. And so if we pray to know God and to love him more, then we have to root our prayers in God's word because that's where he has revealed himself to us. The heart of God is found in his word. And so practically that means that we should pray the word of God 
over ourselves and over each other. This is what we do every Sunday when a member comes up, like Brian did this morning, and read a psalm and, and pray for us. We take God's word and we allow it to guide our prayer. And if you don't know how to do it, but you want to do it, if you go to our resources page, we have a resources page. <laughs> There's a video by Don Whitney. Uh, it's called Praying the Bible. And I think that's a, a good place to start. In that video, he talks about the importance and the benefit of praying scripture and teaches us how to implement that into our prayer life. So now we've talked a little bit about what prayer is, but let's talk a little bit about what prayer is not. So prayer is not a set of magic words that we say to God to get him to do what we want him to do. Um, and I say that because if we get into the habit of thinking that way, we might measure the effectiveness of our prayer strictly by whether or not the things that we pray for come to pass. See, our prayer is effective when we pray according to the will of God. And that's why it's so important for each and every one of us to ground our prayer in Scripture and expect God to act for His glory and for our good. Here's what 1 John 5 says, verses 14 and 50. This is the confidence we have before Him. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. John tells us that when we pray for God's will, we have what we ask. And why do I point this out? Well, I think one of the questions that we can ask about this passage is, why would God allow James to die a martyr and then rescue Peter? Why save one and not the other? It's not because the church wasn't praying for James. As we have seen, the church has always been committed to prayer. It's not because God wasn't able to save James. We see that God saves Peter right out of the grasp of Herod. And he previously had saved the apostles from prison in, back in chapter 5. And I don't have to know each and every one of us personally, but I think we've all at one point in our lives asked this question of why. Like, why does God do the things or allow the things that he does and it's an age-old question, really. Just recently in my own life, I've had to wrestle with a question of why. You know, I had a friend, a couple of us, we were praying for one of our buddies to be um, you know, healed, and we lost him. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, why? Like, why does God allow these things to happen? But what we have to be reminded of throughout Acts is that God works through our experiences to accomplish good that goes beyond our understanding. See, that's the nature of our sovereign God. He is good and he is in control. And so we can know that when we pray and when we trust in him, his will is going to be done. And sometimes that means we experience earthly sorrow, but at the end of our lives, if we trust in him and we stick according to his plans, that we know that it will all be worth it. You know, scripture promises us that at the end of it all, all of our tears will be wiped away. So the church is able to continue to carry out the mission of Acts 1.8 by being committed to prayer. They also continue to carry out the mission of Acts 1.8 because God is in control. Our passage clearly illustrates this idea today. Herod, motivated by selfishness, persecutes the church and murders James. Then the passage tells us that because he saw it pleased the Jews... He arrested Peter too, and the implication here is that Herod was planning to kill Peter next to keep the Jews happy. However, it's probable that you know Herod had heard about the apostles' previous escape back in chapter 5, and so to ensure that Peter won't get away, here's what the passage says, that Peter was bound with two chains and sleeping between two soldiers while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. But the chains and the soldiers are no match for God. God has always been a rescuer of his people. So even through chained and locked, even though chained and locked in a heavily guarded cell, the angel of the Lord is sent to rescue Peter. And this event is so powerful that not even Peter believes what is happening. When the angel wakes him and tells him to get dressed and the chains fall off his wrist, here's what the text tells us. He did not know that what the angel did 
was really happening, but he thought he was seeing a vision. After following the angel out past the remaining guards into the street, Peter realizes what happened, and then here's what he says. Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. See, God turns Herod's plans on his head, reminding everybody that he is still in charge. Though persecution, though persecution rages, God is still on the, tr on the throne. And this is the realization that Peter comes to in verse 11. So he continues out of the street to head to where the believers are praying for him. And what's interesting in the story is that the believers who are praying for Peter, they don't recognize him when he shows up. When Peter knocks on the door, Rhoda, the servant girl, recognizes Peter's voice. And in her excitement, she forgets to open the door. And she runs back to tell the others, and they don't believe her. In fact, they tell her that she's out of her mind. Meanwhile, Peter is still outside, knocking on the gate. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny, right? Peter is outside, knocking on the gate. He wants to get in. You know, he's just been in prison. Um, he wants to join the believers. Rose is excited. She runs inside. And they're inside arguing about whether it's his ghost or if it's really him. And he's still outside, knocking on the door. But here's what the passage says. It says, Peter knocked at the door of the outer gate and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice and because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the outer gate. You're out of your mind, they told her, but she kept insisting that it was true. And they said, it's this angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking and when they opened the door, they saw him, they were amazed. And so what we can see from this is that the church, although they had been praying to God for Peter, was slow to see what God had done. They were fervently praying to God for Peter, but when he showed up at the gate, they didn't believe it. And this goes to show us that God works beyond human understanding. You know, one thing that I've noticed over the years when talking to pastors or church leaders is about whenever they tell stories, the story of like how they got into ministry, they might say something like, I knew God was calling me, but I thought the idea was crazy. Or they may say like, you know, they never wanted to get into ministry in the first place. And I always find that very interesting. Here's a pastor or a church leader who is faithfully serving a congregation, yet they never planned it. Like they never would have been able to see it coming. And I think through testimonies like this, we see God's power displayed in ways that we might miss if there was no struggle, if there was no wrestling out like in the testimony. I think similarly, because the church doesn't expect Peter to show up at their door when he was supposed to be in prison, we see that God's power goes beyond the expectations of his people. This is what we see in Ephesians 3. It says, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To experience this is awe-inspiring. This is what we see at the end of verse 16. After the church realizes that God had answered their prayers beyond their expectations, the text tells us that they were amazed. For the church facing persecution, this is a powerful reminder that God is for them and that he is still taking care of them. For the church, they can add this experience to their memory bank when the road ahead of them get difficult and they can remind each other, you know, do you remember when God delivered Peter from prison? And for those of us who have a relationship with God today, I'm sure if we think we have our own experiences of God's goodness in our lives, that we can recall when the road ahead becomes difficult. And if you struggle to think of memories of your own, or if you forget about the things that God has done in your own life, then I have good news for you, because we have 66 books full of memories that you can go back and you can read and you can see the faithfulness of God to his people. And you can be reminded that God is in control and that he works beyond our understanding. See, grounding ourselves in this truth empowers us to continue to live out Acts 1-8 in our own lives. When we go out into the world, we have nothing to fear, knowing that God has the best plan for our lives. Here's what Jesus says in, in Matthew 10. Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. 
rather fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, despite what happens around us, the only one to truly be feared is God. And this is the humbling reality that many take lightly. Every day that we wake up, we experience new mercy from God. Yet our hearts often don't recognize that, and instead of living for God's will, we live for our own. So at the beginning, I talked about how our plan today was going to be to answer the question, how does the church continue to live out Acts 1-8, even when faced with great persecution? And our two points were that the church is still committed to prayer and that God is in control. We have a third point that's not directly related to answering that question, but I think it comes out from the passage. And that point is that God will not share his glory. In the last section of the passage today, we see Herod face judgment for opposing the people of God and making himself out to be a God. Looking at verse 20, we learn that Herod is angry with Tyre and Sidon, um, but the people there depend on him for food. So what they do is they convince Blastus um, to petition Herod on their behalf so they can ask for peace. Um, their plan seems to work because they get a meeting with Herod, and here's, here's what happens. It says, on an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a speech to them. The assembled people began to shout, It's the voice of God and not of man. At once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. And I don't know if you can see the irony here, but Luke tells us that Herod was dressed in royal robes and seated on a throne, and he's delivering this speech when he was struck down. See, his earthly splendor and economic power are on full display, yet there seems to be a greater king who is able to judge Herod for his arrogance. At the very beginning of the message today, we talked about how Herod was motivated by his own selfish ambitions. He was opposing the people of God through persecution so that it would please the Jews and so that he can keep his job. Now we see him accepting praise like a god, and as a result, he faces judgment pretty much immediately. And there's a contrast here, I think, between King Herod and Rhoda that displays God's pattern of reversal. In a few places throughout scripture, there's this idea that God humbles or resists the proud while exalting the humble and the lowly. And here are two examples of that. Psalm 138, 6, it says, Though the Lord is exalted, he takes note of the humble, but he knows the haughty from a distance. And Matthew 23, 12, it says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And this is what we see in our passage today. Here it is the king who exalts himself far beyond where he should be. And he is humble, to say the least, right? And on the other hand, Rhoda is a lowly servant girl who recognizes the voice of Peter and is the first witness to his escape. She is quick to believe that God miraculously delivered Peter when the other church members were not. And now her name is recorded in scripture for us to read thousands of years later. What we can learn from this is the importance of remaining humble before God. In all that we do or gain or accomplish, we must remember that God is God and we are not. This is probably especially relevant for us here at, at Poly. In STEM, it's very easy for us to feel superior because of you know, the advanced science and engineering that we do. Uh, we may feel like we don't need God. We may not dress up in royal robes and have others call us God, but there are other ways that we don't give God his glory. We do it when we do well in classes, but we don't thank God for our intellect and the ability to study and to remember. We do it when we get good paying jobs and we think that we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We do it when we don't recognize that the gifts and talents that we have all come from God because everything is from God and he alone deserves the glory in our lives. And so how can we give glory to God? Well, I think there are three areas, and it's not exhaustive, but there are three areas that we can look at. We can look at our, our thoughts, we can look at our words, and then our actions. 
we can glorify God in our thoughts by meditating on the Word of God and allowing our minds and our thinking to be conformed to the standards of Scripture. If we're not watchful, we can fall into bad habits of thinking that would dishonor God. And, we can e and that can easily flow over into our words and actions. And so that's why it's so important to shape our thoughts by Scripture. Here's Philippians 4. It says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. We can glorify God in our speech by aligning what we say with the Word of God. Glorifying God in our speech means that we don't use it to tear down others. We don't use our words to, to gossip. Uh, it means that we don't make crude or an insensitive jokes, but that we tame our tongues. Because Proverbs 21, 18 tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we glorify God in our actions by living out the Word of God. This means that we live obedient to His Word. It means that we flee spent sin. It means that we walk with the Spirit. It means that in everything we do, we consider it worship to God. This is what Romans 12, 1 tells us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. See, when we make God the center of our lives, it becomes easier to live for His glory. When we make God the object of our affection, and we make Him the king of our hearts, we're moved to show Him off instead of ourselves. And for those of us in Christ, this is where we have to live every day. Better to be like Rhoda than to be like King Herod. Although Herod had power and riches, in the end, the judgment of God overtook him. And so overall, what we learn in this passage is that the church is still committed to prayer. God is still in control, and he won't share his glory. In the midst of persecution, the church continues to trust God to carry out his plans through them, and he does. He, do this through the, he does this through the good and the bad. And because God is working to carry out his plans through the church, the church grows no matter how many times opp opposition tries to squash the plans of God. This is how the passage ends. But the word of God spread and multiplied. Luke concludes this story with a familiar sounding statement. Like he calls back to previous stories where he uses a similar ending, noting that the church has grown and looks forward to the future of the church where it will continue to grow. As believers today, we are the fruit of a church that continues to grow and we are a part of those who will go out and allow the church to continue to grow even more. Last week in Miami, we got to see a glimpse of that where there were not only believers that we met in South Florida, but there were believers from across the country, from Georgia and Auburn or Albany, and they came to South Florida to serve. Um, and it's just a reminder that the church is a growing church. The church is a global church. And so as we go into a new week, I want to remind all of us that the command to spread the gospel to the end of the church applies to us all. And we have to do it through, pa through prayer, and trust in God, because He is the one who is ultimately in control. And so, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your faithfulness and your love for us. Thank you for this time that we could come together and gather and just read your word and just see how you are a rescuer for your people. And I pray that you would help us to always be committed to prayer, uh, to be committed to trusting you, um, and to remember that you are in control. Um, help us day in and day out to live for your glory um, and for your glory alone because that's the only thing that matters. Um, so we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Now, Bruce will come up and lead us in the Lord's Supper.